In this short uh, lecture, I want to quickly introduce some ideas that I think are important to have in mind when you're studying statistics. Statistics in particular requires a very different approach than the type of you know material that we typically encounter in linguistics. Often we are reading papers and trying to understand ideas. In statistics, uh, the difference is that we have to acquire technical concepts and be able to apply them in real life. So at Potsdam, uh, what we are doing currently is that we are teaching a sequence of courses at the, in the graduate level that involve quite a lot of details. So you can see here in this blog post that I've written that in the winter semester we teach an introduct introduction to frequent statistics and an introduction to Bayesian stats and then in summer we follow up with more advanced versions of these two courses. In winter I will also start teaching case studies in st psycholinguistics where I will discuss um, specific examples of interesting data sets that you know cause interesting problems and how to resolve them and so on. So that will be a new course that I'll be teaching. So students at Potsdam will be doing a sequence of five courses if they really want to get into stats and uh, one of the things that I've noticed in teaching these courses is that often students struggle in these classes because they're not used to working in a certain way. Okay, so I'm going to now try to explain what uh, your mindset needs to be when you're actually working in with these very special courses uh, in the linguistics graduate program. Okay, so most of the comments that I'm making, they're not really original. They're based on insights from, you know, people who've thought about this in much more detail than I have. And so one example is this book by two mathematicians from Princeton, Berger and Starbird, The Five Elements of Effective Thinking. I think everybody should read this book. It's a short book and it really spells out some important ideas on how to deal with and solve difficult problems in your life, in your professional life, I mean, right? But it also applies for real life as well, day-to-day -day problems as well. So I've tried to formalize, formalize what I think are important uh, attitudes you need to develop when doing these courses on statistics. Okay, so the first point is that, this is actually from the Berger and Starbird book, is the first point is that you should try to understand the easy stuff deeply, right? So you should, you have to spend some time understanding basic things that uh, one often thinks are easy, but which uh, often have tricky components to them. So examples are given here. So simple things like the basic rules of probability theory. Uh, I know that we all study this in school, but we forget the details by the time we need them in university. So one has to go back and review all these materials, you know. So uh, you can you can learn to play with these problems. The playing with these ideas, the simple ideas, uh, often helps in understanding them a lot, you know. So uh, I will give examples of this, of course, right? And then there's also basic high school algebra that is often needed uh, as an incidental thing when you're working on a problem. But what happens is that we forget what those basic algebra things are. So for a simple example is if you have an equation like this, y is equal to x divided by 1 minus x. And if I ask you to write an expression with x on the left-hand side and y on the uh, right hand side. This is uh, often quite challenging because we don't do this on a daily basis, right? We forget. So one has to review this and you should not hesitate to go back and review things that you might have studied many years ago. Another example of the kind of things you will require in life uh, when studying statistics is, you know, things like if you have two exponents and you, you multiply two terms like this, x to the power of 2 multiplied with x to the power of 3, what is the result of this multiplication? Is it x to the power of 5 or x to the power of 6? To be honest, uh, when I started studying statistics uh, at, at the graduate level, you know, I had to think a little bit about this. It was because I had forgotten you know, what I had learned in school. So you have to go back and not hesitate to, you know, review what you might have learned a long time ago. 
often these kinds of questions can be answered by playing around with uh, simple examples right so a very simple example is what is a log right what is log to uh, log 1 or log 0 right? these are questions you can actually answer by just using r for example right so suppose i write here what is log 1 this tells me the answer what is log 0 right this also tells me the answer that it's minus infinity. So these are questions that uh, sometimes turn up in the course of you know the lecture and you're not sure what exactly the result of log 1 is. You can try it out and find out. You know? So you have to sometimes pause and think about this a little bit. Now talking about understanding the easy stuff deeply. So one of the most important concepts that lie behind everything in statistics is uh, probability distributions, right? So this is something we should learn to play with and understand. In particular, when we do linear mixed models, we will encounter the multivariate distribution. And there, some playing around is very much uh, desirable, right? So I'll, I will just show you some examples, okay? So, so just to give a simple uh, example here, right? So if I want to try to understand the normal distribution, right? I I understand it in principle, but maybe not too deeply, right? Uh, how can I get an intuition of many of the concepts relating to a normal distribution? What do I need to do? Let's let's think about that a little bit, okay? So, so one thing I would always do, which I always do in my own experiments and you know thinking about problems, is that. I will uh, try to simulate some data. So R norm is a nice function for generating normally distributed data. This is going to generate 100 random data points with some mean and standard deviation. So I'm just choosing 0 and 1 as uh, means and standard deviations as an example. And so I can just generate some data now. Let's call it Y, right? And now I can look at the properties of this data. I can calculate the mean of Y, right? It's not 0. It's pretty surprising. That the mean of y is not zero. Why is that? Well, if I run some, um, you know, r r new random data, I'll get a different mean each time. What's going on, right? Why does the mean keep changing, right? It's changing because I'm randomly sampling from a particular distribution, and I will get different numbers each time. It's the same thing with standard deviation. I'm going to get different standard deviations every time I uh, generate some new data, right? They're slightly different each time. So now, not exactly the true value of one either, right? So this is an interesting thing. This gives you a feeling for what it means to have, you know, random data, and uh, graph developing graphical intuition for what it means to, you know, sample data is also useful. So you can just plot a distribution and get a feeling for what a, a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one will look like right so this is so suppose now i increase the mean to 100 what will the distribution look like right what happens is that the center point of the distribution shifts a little bit or not a little bit quite a bit right if i change the standard deviation to 102 look at what happens to the distribution the mean still remains near 100 but the spread of the distribution increases a lot so this kind of graphical you know playing around helps you develop intuitions about distributions, right? That's that's very useful. Another example, another important idea that I just mentioned was the idea of a bivariate or multivariate distribution, right? So I will show you in the course, of course, how to play with this, but you can generate simulated data with a library called MASS, sorry, library called MASS. There's an MVR norm function, which is just like the R norm function, which allows you to generate data that is, let's say, bivariate data that has mean zero and some variance covariance matrix. I will explain all what all this is later on. But what I want to show you is that I can actually easily generate correlated data. Okay. Um, so I would need to define some kind of standard deviations for each of the distributions, and I would need to describe some correlation between the data points. Right. So I'm going to now generate correlated data that is positively correlated. So when one value increases, the other value also increases, right? So how do I do that? Of course, I haven't explained all this yet, and you will see later on how I do this. 
but uh, I'm just you have to just trust me on what I'm doing right now but what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate some correlated data now right so let's just do this see what this looks like now yeah that's good I'm ready to go now so I'm going to generate some data which I'll save in a matrix called U right so if I look at what I've just done here I've generated 100 data points that are correlated to each other. This vector and this vector are positively correlated. And I can actually visualize this by uh, plotting the two columns, right? And if I do this, run this plot command, I see this positive correlation between these data points. I can actually generate negatively correlated data also. If you minus 0.6 correlation between the data points by just changing this one variable, generate some new random data and you see that the correlations are switched to negative. I can also generate uncorrelated data by changing this parameter here to zero and then generating new data and then plotting the distribution and you see that now there seems to be no association between these two variables, right? If I increase the number of data points, I'll see that even more clearly, right? So I've got like a million data points now and what I see it takes a long time to plot a million data points now but once this plots you will see that there will be just a no pattern that you will see at all with this one million data points so maybe i chose too many data points now uh, eventually this would show up so the point i'm showing you is uh, that you can actually develop graphical intuition intuitions about ideas uh, that are really important in statistics things like frequency distributions and probability distributions by uh, playing with simulated data, right? That will be a fundamental principle that we will use in trying to understand uh, statistics, right? We are not statisticians. We are not professional mathematicians. So we are not going to do analytical derivations and try to understand stuff in, in the abstract. We're going to just use simulation to try to get a feeling for what the what the behavior of systems is under different conditions okay so i think i was very ambitious in generating 1 million data points let me stop this uh remove this plot and clear all the plots so that i can like show you again <laughs> what i was trying to do so this is somewhat crazy on my part so let's just take 10000 data points okay that's more realistic and so if I plot these 10,000 data points, and now you see that there is no association at all between these data points here. It's just a blob uh, showing no correlation between these two data points, right? Okay. So that's a good way to develop intuition on how, uh, you know, probability distributions behave. Okay. So I will say, of course, much more about this later on. So that's what I mean when I say understand the easy stuff deeply. So don't just get, don't just rely on my telling you, you know, that this is a normal distribution, this is a binomial distribution. Play with it a bit yourself uh, with different under different conditions to get an idea of what it's all about. Uh, another important skill to learn is to be willing to make mistakes, right? So mistakes are your friend. So you should not hesitate to just get stuff wrong. I think in homework assignments or during you know online discussions with me if you give the wrong answer nothing bad is going to happen it's a good way to learn right and so uh, this is a very difficult skill to learn because in school we are taught the opposite we are taught that we should always be right and we get penalties for getting stuff wrong at the university level this is a completely different ball game right the, the we are working at the edge of understanding always and that uh, when you're at the edge of your understanding you're going to make mistakes and you should learn to enjoy making mistakes and you learn from them become curious from your mistakes and learn to you know uh, improve based on that okay so that's a very important skill it takes time to retrain yourself to think about this but i strongly advise you to do that i i've had a very successful career mainly because i don't hesitate to embarrass myself in public i'm happy to get it wrong and then be corrected okay and i've been wrong almost every time in my life okay so um 
the other thing relates to my previous point about understanding stuff deeply that you have to develop some curiosity about your problem so don't just uh, work on the exact problem that i've given you you can ask your own question generate your own questions and ask yourself what if questions and ask yourself okay what would happen if the situation was slightly more different is uh, slightly different from what the homework assignment describes okay and so in order to do this kind of exploration you have to be ready to spend some time on it right so the technically this uh, you know the student or knowing the teaching requirements uh, generally demand that you spend about 10 hours a week on every course that you do what i have noticed is that people generally don't spend more than 2 or 3 hours per week on the homework assignments if i look at the submissions i get the feeling that they didn't have enough time to do this this might have to do with the fact that you are given a large palette of courses that you have to do every semester and like just the sheer mental overload of dealing with multiple courses is too much okay so this is an organizational problem i also face it as a as a pi of my lab i have some 15 people in my group and everyone is working on different problems so i often end up working on 15 different things with my students uh and it's very disorienting and it's very hard to concentrate on any one thing one has to learn to do this okay so you have to somehow figure out a way to create a block of time so let's say 5 hours just clear your deck for 5 hours of work when working on a homework problem don't put yourself under time pressure by doing it at the last minute give you start early on the problem so you have enough time to actually hit a roadblock and try to solve it and without time pressure okay? this will help you do your assignments much better so never do an assignment at the last minute right because that will uh, lead to stress and lead to substandard uh, attempts okay so given that you have created enough time for yourself you can always explore the given problem that i've given you as a homework problem you can always explore it by studying the extreme conditions right so suppose i give you a a, a question about fitting a linear mixed model of a particular type you can go beyond my question and ask yourself okay what would happen if i just did something totally ridiculous like fitting a simple linear model instead of a linear mixed model nobody's going to find out that you did that and it will be a good exercise for you to see what the difference would be between a linear mixed model that i asked you to fit versus a linear model that i didn't ask you to fit right and so often in like other exercises for example in a bayesian course that i teach i might give you some prior specification for a correlation parameter and ask you to use that you can uh, you can ask yourself what would happen if i did something crazy like using a different prior specification right so those are little toy problems you can generate for yourself and ask yourself what would happen and you learn a lot that way okay Okay so that's that's another important thing uh, to to be curious and ask yourself generate your own questions right another important advice i have for you is to try to keep very careful notes for yourself right so my lecture notes and my slides are of course intended to summarize the material for you but don't just rely on that you should also make your own notes the mere act of writing down your own version of the story right will help you understand it better right and i am very rigorous about my when i am a student when i am being a student i am very rigorous about this i write down my notes very carefully carefully i even write latex notes as you can see here in uh, i did an msc in statistics once and i spent huge amounts of my time just synthesizing what i had understood in lecture notes and this has served me very well in in the subsequent years when i needed to go back and review things that i forgot right i always forget stuff and then you have to go and remind yourself so this is a very useful thing exercise to do keep your own notes okay another piece of advice i have for you is try to have a real problem you want to solve right so many of the things exercises that i give you are real problems from real published papers that i have encountered but you will uh you will care more about the material if you actually have your own problem that you want to solve right there you will uh, you can use my ideas that i'm teaching you in the course to actually apply them for your problem and so often what will happen is that your own problem 
has a solution that I have not presented in the course, right? You may have to actually go beyond what I have taught. That's okay. You can actually ask yourself, okay, given what he has taught me, can I do something that approximates a solution to my problem? Right. So, if, for example, if you have binomial data, you can start by asking yourself completely ridiculous questions like, what would happen if I fit a linear model with a normal likelihood, you know, to this data? That is an insane thing to do, but nobody can stop you from doing it. And you might actually learn something interesting by doing this, you know. So, you can fit simpler models to your data, even if you know that they're wrong. But if that's what you have learned so far, then you can use it and see what you get and find out what's missing. You know, all this, this is also a way to ask yourself um, uh, questions to become curious about uh, the methods you're learning in the context of your own problem, right? That makes it real and more interesting for you. Of course, not everybody will have their own problem, but if you can have a research problem to work on, then this is a nice way to get into the material with your own issues, okay? Another skill that, you know, universities should teach you is to learn to Google information, right? So nowadays it's so easy to find information, but we actually don't learn to acquire this skill though so easily, right? So you can always figure out something uh, by Googling it, right? So one thing that often happens to me is that, you know, like I will, um, uh, so let's see. So suppose I want to load some data. What's my current working directory? Let me just find out. Right, so I'm I'm in this directory right now, and uh, I if I want to load some data, let's see. So this data should be available to me. So let's say I want to load some data, right? I happen to be in the correct directory right now. So if I run this command, it will work fine, and I will be able to load my data correctly. But suppose my directory was different. Suppose, uh, suppose I had, uh, suppose I restart R. Okay, so now my current directory is this one here, right? My current directory is wrong here. It's oh no, it's not wrong. Let me just change this to some other directory. Let's see. Uh, set working directory. Choose directory. Let's say. Let me put it somewhere ridiculous like this one here. Okay. So now what's going to happen is that my current working directory is my Git directory. This directory called Git. Now if I run this command, I'm going to get an error message. So this error message says, error in file RT cannot open the connection. Now I don't know what this means, right? As a beginner, sometimes I have no idea what's going on here. This is a very panic inducing event now that I've got this frightening word error. And I don't know what to do. Well, here's what I would do if I was a beginner learning R. I was just going to copy that error message and stick it into Google and see what happens. Right? And lo and behold, it turns out that on Stack Overflow, somebody's encountered this problem before. And they've asked this question and find out, like, what is happening? It's this guy saying, I'm new to R. I never opened this before. This is all happening to me right now, by the way. Okay? And it says, I'm getting this error. And then somebody answers that it looks like you have a directory, uh, blah, 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 and you're in the wrong directory, basically. They must be explaining this somewhere, right? You need to change directory. Somebody is explaining all this, right? So this is a common event. You run some command, you get some error message, you don't know what it means. What one can often do is just Google it, you know? So you can learn to uh, find answers like this. I think this is a very important skill learning to find information. And I mean, there are many interesting tools available for this. So Google Scholar is a wonderful tool, you know, for asking questions. Uh, so here what you see is that Google is telling me, it knows what kind of papers I read, you know. So it's making suggestions for me here. But if I'm interested in, for example, leave one out, cross-validation, um, I can look up papers that give me some information on this. So Akivetari's papers are very important in this respect and I can see some important papers here. If I want to know something about base factors, right, and I want to read some papers on this, I can find some. This is a very important paper on base factors that I would want to read if I was a beginner. Uh, what's another example, right? Likelihood ratio tests, right? So I don't know what these are, so I may want to read some papers on this, but I mean, there's also, if you just Google this, 
what is the likelihood ratio test you can get curious about that you know and look up wikipedia for example i wouldn't look up these statistics how to stuff but wikipedia articles are often quite useful right so they can explain a lot of things that you might not um otherwise encounter easily and you know if you don't have access to a textbook you can certainly look up uh, this kind of stuff so you should get used to looking up stuff you know when you don't know something and i mean one skill that you have to acquire is asking the right question using the right keyword you know and this requires some experience so but this is an important thing to work with right to learn how to find information you should not hesitate to just go on a google run and discover you know information on stuff okay and then um <clears throat> another very important skill as you go through a lecture the lecture materials is that you should try to look for connections between ideas so one really weird thing for example that uh, you know that i will make you aware of in this course is that the t test you know the t t test that we use the linear model that we use the linear mix model that we use the aov the analysis of various variance function all these functions that we are using right these are <laughs> these are all the same thing basically it's all different ways of doing exactly the same test with you know certain advantages and disadvantages from different perspectives we are taught all this you know sequence of things as if they are like different cookbook methods that you use but it's actually underlying this underlyingly the same one thing that we are doing over and over again right and so this is what i mean by connections between ideas you will discover this of course in the course of the the lectures that i teach but um you have to also try to uh, go and discover this yourself a little bit you know so what happened to me once was that i discovered by accident the connection between the pair t test and the linear mix model this was not obvious to me you know and one day i just asked myself so what is the difference between a paired t test and a linear mix model then i started playing with some data and then i i noticed that i was getting identical results by doing the two tests and then i later on i worked out the analytical proof for that and that's in this blog post here you can look at it if you ever want to right so it's the the paired t test is just the same thing as a linear mix model with varying intercepts and i proved that here analytically right it's pretty easy to do this proof if you know a little bit about you know how these tests are assembled but it wasn't obvious to me you know and you you can figure these things out by playing with them a little bit so these are the main skills i want you guys to acquire or to have in mind when you're actually working through statistics okay in the courses that i teach okay and finally what i want to say is that it may happen that after you've done these courses you get curious about reading more advanced textbooks which require some mathematical background we do teach a course on foundations of mathematics which covers the basic undergraduate maths that you need to understand more advanced texts you don't really need any of this material for my courses but if you ever get curious about uh, you know going deeper into machine learning and doing computer science courses and in fact some of you in the msc cognitive system program will have to do those machine learning courses and you're required to do these foundations of math courses if you haven't done them so this course is actually useful for getting the formal you know uh background in uh, all the math that we won't really cover in these statistics but which i sometimes hint at you know in the courses that i teach okay so that's the i wanted to give you this little this little pep talk if you like on how you should approach these courses you have to you have to stay relaxed when you don't understand stuff and uh be willing to explore a little bit on your own to see uh, what's missing in your understanding and try to fill those gaps by you know exploring the information that's available and of course you can always ask me or ask on the the moodle web page uh you can raise questions and somebody me or someone else will always try to answer those questions okay so that's one way that you can always fill the gaps in your understanding okay so that's that's my introduction to studying statistics and um that's all for now <laughs>